I think we would like to go to some, you know, distinguished guests for some comments about today's events, about the Chomping Lab. I would first go to Tom, then to Xiao Feng, okay, because Tom is the most senior scientist in the audience. Well, um, can you hear me? So uh, this has been a fantastic day. Uh, I've enjoyed this uh, tremendously. Uh, the talks have been spectacular. And personally, uh, you know, I've uh, benefited, uh, and the United States has benefited by the students and postdoctoral fellows from China. And I, uh, I'm very proud of, of, of the students who have come from China into my lab. And I deeply hope uh, this will continue in the future because it, it, it enriches and helps both countries in a, in a major way. So uh, it's been a while since I've been here, but uh, I've just, there's so much energy, so much excitement here uh, in science that really, you know, 10 years ago, you know, it was uh, when I visited my biopic. So I'd like to toast uh, everyone here who uh, had uh, organized this symposium, brought all of us together for a, a truly interesting scientific uh, symposium and a celebration of, uh, of, of science. Thank you, Tom. Cheers. This, your message is well taken. It's just like the, uh, in the last message of the uh, sand painting. You, the world is united under double helix. Okay, so next, cell phone. Wow. I guess you all want to eat or drink rather than hear, hear me <laughs> to say something. Um, uh, on behalf of the Champion Laboratory, I just uh, want to welcome you guys, uh, especially uh, those distinguished guests from com uh, coming abroad. So, um, you know, I was the last speaker for today, and um, maybe I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of history, and because I've been in this place for more than 18 years, more than 18 years. So I was trained in the U.S. as a graduate student and a little bit of postdoc at Harvard, actually. Uh, so I came back in 2005 and recruited by, by Xiao Dong Wang, uh, so uh, uh, at NIPS, so back to 18 years ago, more than 18 years ago, and this area is mostly farmlands. This area is mostly farmlands. So we have a very lonely institute here uh, called the National Institute of Biological Sciences and uh, uh, started by Xiao Dong and uh, was 2004, I came 2005. <coughs> So we have been working together and to build the institute and uh, you know, we trained many uh, scientists, recruited many scientists from abroad, trained the students. And um, so three years ago, and the government decided to start another adventure research institute called uh, Changping Laboratory. I guess, uh, you know, Sunny is willing to uh, take the lead to uh, head the institute, to run the institute and uh, I was uh, uh, recruited by, by uh, Sunny again uh, to help him, uh, I guess for two reasons. And uh, one reason is because I've been here for so long, so I know this place very well. And the second reason is probably because um, I'm probably very critical, one of the very critical scientists uh, uh, here, so uh, he wants me, he wants someone to know biology and be critical to every project. So, and I was the ideal person uh, to, to, to do that. So that's the story. So that's why we have, uh, this is uh, three, years, uh, three years anniversary uh, today. So to be honest, this morning today, you know, we learn a lot. Uh, we cover the DNA sequencing, uh, immunology, and uh, um, you know, CRISPR gene editing technology is very broad. Uh, indeed, this is, you know, our institute, NIPS, as well as Champion Laboratory, we are also very broad. You know, we just wanted, we just wanted to do innovative science, and um, 
not necessarily focused on a particular topic. So uh, this today is a very heavy, science-heavy uh, day today. So um, uh, we, you know, and before the scientific section, we have this historic section, you know, for a person in my generation, and I really learned a lot, you know. Uh, I was born uh, 20 years after the DNA double helix. So I don't know really, you know, I was a chemistry undergraduate. I was a chemistry undergraduate. And I, after I uh, graduated from college, I, I don't know double helix. I don't know the central dogma, you know. Was, so it was very uh, fresh, uh, uh, reflecting uh, for me, you know, as a, as a relatively young person and uh, now, trained, now trained originally as a biologist. So uh, the question, that I have been thinking when I listen uh, to those uh, historical uh, reflections and uh, talks is, is that for my generation or younger generation, what, we should, what should we do? Because, you know, double helix in 1953 and uh, uh, stimulate the birth of molecular biology. You know, Tom Maniatis is here, right? So that was the 80s and 90s. Molecular biology revolutionized every every direction or every subfield in biology. So we have so many distinguished scientists here, and they all made breakthrough contributions through molecular biology in the 80s, 90s, right? But I started my lab in 2005, right? <laughs> so uh, it's it's a time that we need to rethink. Uh, when molecular biology has already uh, driven the progress or revolutionized every biological field, right? So, uh, so we have been, I have been thinking about that. So how we should do, yeah. I'll stop here, leave the question to you guys. Yeah, sure. Enjoy the dinner, enjoy the meal. Folks are hun hungry and uh, you know, thirsty and uh, for wine. And uh, we also have uh, some few other guests who want to give me a comment. So next, uh, Shankar, please. Say a few words. <coughs> well, we have food in front of us. So, uh, <laughs> I, I won't be very long, but uh, I think um, this is my second second visit to mainland China. I came first in 2019, and uh, I, I've been here the whole week. And I'd like to thank everyone, actually, because I don't remember another trip in my life where I've been hosted so, so warmly and generously with, with absolute attention to every detail by everyone who spent time with me. So thank you to everyone who's part of that. Secondly, um, what a wonderful conference, but <clears throat> organizing something like this is much harder than it looks. And so Sonny was organizing, I know, at 4 a.m. in the morning. We were getting messages about this morning session. So, tremendous hard work. Um, and I, I think it's a very high bar to do something that's worthy of the double helix. Indeed. But, but you, you've met that high bar of flying colors. So, um, just like to say congratulations to everyone um, involved in the organization. Um, I, I guess the last message is, um, Science has no borders. It is a common language, and it is also a common culture. So we can go anywhere in the world to any language, and um, just as we feel here, we feel at home with fellow scientists. And I think the future of the, future of the world depends on and needs international scientific collaboration and sharing. So uh, uh, just sort of a toast to um, the future of science, which is very much a global affair. Indeed. Thank you, Thank you so much, Shankar. Um, indeed, it's, it's uh, international collaboration is so important to uh, the sci science. And we are privileged to be in this whole family of uh, as science under the you know, House of Science, okay. So now next I want to give a chance to one of the students 
to make some comments, okay, before I, uh, the, uh, for the last guest uh, should make some comment is off, uh, off red. So, the student, introduce yourself, please. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm a student from the affiliated high school of Peking University. And uh, first of all, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to uh, personally connect with the forefront of the biology, which has really m made a pr tremendous impact on, uh, on me of the knowing the, how the uh, biology have developed. And um, w when, I, w when I see the <laughs> the presentation that, uh, that every scientist have made, uh, I was really can felt the, uh, their the wholehearted love for uh, biology and uh, for my own life, I've been privileged by uh, being uh, raised by a father who is neurosurgeon and a post um, a postgraduate from the 1990s. So he often told me that the 20th century is the uh, the century, of the 21st century is the century of biology, and now I have the gain the effect that I think the 22nd century will also be the century of biology, <laughs> and um, this experience I think it determines my determination and aspiration in biology, and I think w I can dream more widely in the future in biology. And one day I can, uh, I think, I wish I could raise this up and to be a part of the uh, devotion into the uh, into biology. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, good luck, good luck in the rest of uh, you know your career and or pursuit of uh, science. And uh, the, for the last commenter from this session is uh, Fred. Okay, Fred, P please uh, say something. Oh. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I would first reiterate what Tom said. I mean, I think I'm so pleased that our interactions are opening up again with China. Um, I, I was counting, I think now, uh, 17 of my trainees are now running labs in China, which is great. I mean, maybe about half that many in the U.S. So a lot of success that we've enjoyed over the last decades or so has mainly been from all the unbelievably wonderful students that were sent to us from China. And I really hope that that will continue. Um, so the other thing I would say is uh, I want to really congratulate Sonny for starting this institute. I mean, I think it's in wonderful hands. He, he's a great leader. He's an incredible thinker. Um, in fact, um, a number of years ago, uh, I started a collaboration with Sonny. Uh, we raised a little bit of money on one of these across the river bridge things, Harvard Medical School, Harvard University. And we started a program together to sort of look at uh, the, 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 the genome in the brain and, and, and understand how breaks were happening and worked. And that was wonderful. I got to meet several of his students, got to know him well. We knew him, uh, got to know him well enough that I knew that pretty much everybody who was in the program that I run, for example, Yu Zhang sitting over here, uh, we. When Sonny was moving back, the idea was we could maybe recruit him and keep him at Harvard Medical School for uh, um, a, a while in our program. And in fact, I gave up some space in my own lab, and Sonny and, and his students, uh, Long Si Tan and Yulong Chao, uh, came over and looked at the space. We had it all ready. We were all ready to set up. Our faculty voted unanimously that Sonny should be a member of our program. He came to our retreat as a member, but then the pandemic came, um, some of the relationships with uh, internationally with China, U.S. got a little strained, and it ended up not working out, much to our detriment, but I'm really glad that it'll, to be here. And the other thing I just want to say is that um, when Sonny had dinner with me um, the night that I arrived here, and after we were, you know, toasting a little bit, he asked me to uh, relate a, 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 an anecdote that I told him, um, and, and uh, it was about Watson and Crick. And um, I, I, I had the great pleasure in my career of meeting Jim Watson very early on. Um, I was a graduate student at Stanford. I was working in the lab, and um, 
My advisor, Bob Shimke, who Don Cleveland mentioned today, was out of town. Jim Watson, who I had never met, but I'd seen photos, and I saw the guy coming, he was wearing that same little hat and everything, and wandering through the hallway, looking around, and he came up to me and he said, I'm, I'm looking for Bob Shimke. And I, I said, why? And he said, well, I heard you have something really interested in uh, new, new data. And I, that ended up, it was what I was working on. And uh, so he came in, sat down with me, talked to me for about an hour about what we were doing, and that was my introduction to Jim Watson. Then after Tom um, resigned from doing the cloning course at Cold Spring Harbor for many years, they asked me to take it over, which I did. And uh, then, of course, I got to go to the cloning course because it was in James Hall where Jim's office was. Invited him to speak in the lectures, talk to him all the time. You know, he was always an exciting, interesting person. But the final story, I just wanted the anecdote that Sonny asked me to relay was, um, so at the Cold Spring Harbor Cromanton meeting in 1977, um, my advisor, Bob Shimke, was in Australia. And they asked him to speak. He, so he, I ended up going in his place to talk about the gene amplification work. And I was there. I was a speaker. And um, now the interesting thing was it was like the interchanges that happened today towards the end of the second session in the afternoon, a little bit of significant discussion and back and forth. So I was, I walked in, I had never met Francis Crick and I really didn't know him, but I walked in, they had a little television screen on one of the side rooms near the regular lecture hall. I came in late, so I sat down and then Francis Crick came in and sat down next to me. And so I was like, wow, this is Francis Crick. You know? And we were sitting there listening to some talks and, 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 and he wanted to say something to the person who was on the stage, actually in the middle of the talk. And he was getting anxious and sort of bumping me a little bit. And then he got up and he walked out and then I was looking at the TV screen because it was the old days, you had a camera at the end of the hallway and d towards the stage and I saw his head go down the screen and he looked up at the speaker and said, you know, you should not be up here talking in a main session because you're an amateur. And you know, and, and then that was, you, you remember that, Tom? I think you were at that meeting. What? But the, the story didn't end there. So, so, so I was a speaker, I was a graduate student, I was frightened and uh, then, um, and, and so, but I was, I was put into a, uh, a car that night. I, it was arranged to go to the, the, the dinner with the, um, with the donors at their houses that Jim always arranged. And I get to the car and I was put in the front seat, but in the back seat was that speaker and Francis Crick. And that was an interesting, and I guess it was done so that, you know, they could uh, have their discussion in private over dinner. Um, so that was pretty uh, interesting to me. We came back, and the final story of the next day, which is one of the most amazing things I've seen in my life, um, there was a scientist, a great man named Charles Weissman. You know this story, Tom. You were there, right? <laughs> yes. And so I didn't know anything. Charles Weissman, I just looked at him. Well, he's just a, seemed a, a God, you know, another amazing figure. He was head of many institutes. He got up on stage, he was wearing a black jacket with a black shirt, and he got up and he was giving talks, chromatin structure biology, and he turned around and he took off his jacket and he put it on a chair and he swung around, and when he was pointing at the board, the whole audience just looked in awe. His, the back of his black t-shirt was written in big white letters, amateur. <laughs> so that, that was the way t people interacted before they were on the internet and they were in person. Anyway. Anyway. Thank you very much, Fred. So now I also want to have uh, some comments from other distinguished guests. I would like to invite Dennis to say a few words about uh, the event and the laboratory. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to actually congratulate Sunny for having put together a most incredible meeting. Actually, to me, I feel like I'm a sort of a, a pop music fan going to a concert type of feeling, right? because I think the, um, actually I haven't been to a, such a good conference for many years now. And then this one I think is particularly uh, close to my heart because I think I uh, started actually going to Cambridge um, 
because actually I saw what's in Craig's picture in front of King's College Chapel. Mm -hmm. And then even just looking at this table, actually many of you actually have uh, influenced my life and my career in, in many ways. Starting with Tom, you know, without your manual, I probably won't be standing here. And then I still remember uh, uh, Liu De Pui, uh, Yuan Si. Uh, actually, he interviewed me actually when, when I applied for an award um, about 15 years ago. And of course, uh, Shank uh, uh, Hagen, I use your system, you know, almost on a, on a daily basis. And of course, Will, I use uh, ATAC-C very frequently as well. So, so I think this is really incredible uh, meeting that I'll always remember. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. Okay. So um, tonight, in fact, um, we have um, this event. It's uh, generously supported by um, a biotech company, okay, Cushing. They generously uh, uh, provide each and every attendees with the broad spectrum of neutralizing antibody against COVID-19, which so far hasn't, you know, uh, been catch up by the virus yet. Okay, so, and uh, the, uh, um, it was a Chairman Yin's company who, you know, generously, uh, you know, support, and uh, the drug will be provided to each and everyone um, this evening. Okay, so uh, let me say, uh, ask, invite, uh, Chairman Yen to say a few words. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the support of science. We really need this, you know, the money and the, the um, you know, support from the industry, okay? So next I would invite uh, James to say a few words about, you know, the meeting. All right, so I, I guess while everybody is still eating, um, where's, where's Sunny? Okay, Sunny, congratulations again uh, on the, uh, the third year anniversary and also uh, for putting together this wonderful event. I really don't have anything profound to say. <laughs> But um, this morning, uh, Sankar's picture about University of Cambridge actually reminded me of my recent visit to Cambridge. I was there about six months ago for a conference, and I stayed in the Christ uh, College, which is a Darwin's College. And then I took one afternoon out to do sightseeing, and of course, I visited the old uh, Cavendish lab laboratory. But when I got there, to my surprise, actually, the laboratory was kind of demolished, and there was nothing to be found about the Watson and Crick's uh, old office, so I was quite surprised by that. Um, and then, of course, I went on to visit, you know, other places, including uh, Newton's uh, statue, uh, Maxwell's statue, uh, Aaron uh, Turing's uh, place. And, and I was, you know, really uh, thinking that why is it that this one university, University of Cambridge, you know, have so many scientists whose work has really changed the world, each of them. I think it was just one country that has one Newton, or one Maxwell, or one Watson Creek, or one Turing, I think it would be quite remarkable. But it's amazing that this one university has, um, has all of them. And so I was left with actually two questions, and maybe Sanka or Tom can help answer this. One is that why, why did they demolish the old Cavendish laboratory, which has produced like 30 Nobel laureates? I think this will not happen in China. I think we have, 
if we had made a discovery like a you know, DNA double helix, there would be a very s sacred place. I, I bet there would be a national monument. So for the students who will make a discovery like a DNA double helix, I think you can count on China putting a national monument. And the, and the second question, which I think we all need to think about, especially including for Changping Laboratory, and that is, why is it that you know, one university, University of Cambridge, um, can nurture scientists who sort of not only uh, have won so many Nobel Prizes, but have really done this work that you know, has changed the world. And I think we all need to think about it. I don't have an answer to that, but maybe uh, Tom or Sankar would have an answer to these questions. Uh, okay. Dan, please. Thank you very much. Thank, no, 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 not yet, not yet, not yet. Thank you. So the next, I would like to invite Dan. Dan, to, Dan, Dan, to give, give a few words. Sorry. So, so I, actually, I w wanted to know in why C Cambridge uh, used to be such a good place as well. I thought that was the uh, anyway. So, so thank you, Sunny. Thank you for this for the opportunity. I ha this is the first opportunity for many of us to have been to China, you know, since the, COVID, the reopening, and uh, it's always a pleasure. T today's session what was it was truly outstanding. I'm really hopeful that all of you hang around to the end of tomorrow and, and that tomorrow turns out to be just as well. So, uh, Sunny, congratulations on, uh, it, it, it's obviously a, it's a huge endeavor. They have a dynamic, they have dynamic, thoughtful leadership. I wish you best of the success. Thank you very much, uh, Don. Um, Shankar, would you uh, echo the uh, question from James? Oh, I feel like I'm being victimized. <laughs> so I think it's a wonderful question. There, there are two parts to it, actually. And, uh, you know, if you go into my college, Trinity College, you won't even notice which room was Newton's room because it has students staying in that room now. It's not a museum. It's not a monument. There are no markings. And, and as you say, the Cavendish has a few discrete things. I think this is cultural. Uh, you know, in the, the UK, England is, continues to be quite understated about how it expresses things. Now, I actually think science, today is a celebration of science, today and tomorrow, and I actually think we should shout loud for scientists and celebrate scientific discoveries and collective achievements uh, that have changed the world. So I, I, so I actually think uh, that's an area where we could improve actually in the UK. I think uh, it's probably gone too far the other way. So why were there so many um, amazing discoveries? Well, 200 years ago or 100 year, years ago, uh, fewer, fewer people were doing science on the planet. So I think science was a, it was a, it was a practice for a privileged few in a small number of countries. So in a sense, there was less uh, instant day-to-day -day competition in science. And I think that meant in turn that People who did science, they really, really wanted to do it. And they could spend a whole lifetime working on one problem without, Isaac Newton didn't publish many papers in nature or science. I, he probably has a lower H index than everyone in this room. Didn't matter, didn't matter. So I, I think the, the emphasis on uh, competition and performance while to some degree is necessary, it, it changes the culture of how, how we think about science. 
Um, and, and so we, you know, we, we, we may need to ask the question, how should we think about science in the future? Uh, do we leave it in the hands of editors of journals to decide and determine who gets promoted, who gets appointed, um, or, or do we choose some other method for evaluating scientific progress? I, I think the other part is, if you've been to Cambridge, you'll know that it's quite small. And in my photograph, I showed there was the Cavendish Laboratory. It was physically attached to the chemical laboratory. And actually, Newton was a chemist, a physicist, a philosopher, a mathematician, etc. Um, so, so I think uh, we now call it interdisciplinary science, but I think there was a time when um, our great scholars were broad thinkers who had no boundaries. And uh, science has evolved into very niche, specialized clubs that we each belong to. And we try to recapitulate a broader picture by having mechanisms to do interdisciplinary science. So third thing I'd say, and, and I think this is very much a characteristic of the MRC LMB recent history, is um, there was a pressure and a need to work on truly important problems in the past. And uh, I, I think now there is a certain amount of gap filling in the world. Not everybody is working on um, important problems all the time. But, but there is a recipe there to, to be followed. It's a long answer, perhaps a partial answer to your question. Thank you, Shankar. Thank you. So last but not least, let's give, ask Sunny, our host, to say you know, the final words before the music. I'm holding in my hand a leather-bound copy of Double Helix, the book by James Watson. It was a cherished gift that he gave me in 2019 when I visited him right before I came back. I read this book when I was an undergraduate at Peking University. Chemistry student in love of physics, I had no idea that one day I would uh, go into life science. It is very unfortunate that Jim couldn't join us today. He was so looking forward to his trip here until he recently caught COVID. He was advised not to travel long distance. Now, since he's not here, I am at the liberty to share with you some trivia. Do you know whose birthday is today? No. <laughs> yeah. We actually had our opening ceremony on October 24, but thank you, Xiaodong. <laughs> That's awfully kind. Yan Yi this morning told me, I don't track this, right? So Yan Yi sent me a WeChat message. Today is the birthday of uh, Alfred Nobel. 180 years ago, he was born. Okay. So James, at the end of your talk, you talk about the Nobel Prize for double helix was the ceiling of Nobel Prize, or at least for life science, right? Well, do you guys know how much it costs? They just raised the Nobel Prize, uh, the price this year, right? So after Quick passed away, his family auctioned his medal. And guess how much? It was uh, 2.4 million US dollars. And it was bought by a Chinese businessman. Now Jim, 
you know, he he's competitive, right? So he was under the shadow of uh, the smart physicist. You know, he was curious how much his would auction. It was auctioned at 4.2 million US dollars and it was bought by a Russian businessman. He was the only living Nobel laureate who auctioned his medal, okay? I'm happy to report that the Russian billionaire returned the medal to him and asking him, never auction that again. And Jim donated some of the money to University of Chicago, his alma mater, and Cold Spring Harbor lab. I also want to echo on what's said about uh, Cambridge. I am delighted that uh, at this meeting we have a large Cambridge presence. So we have a Shankar, we have a Hagen, and uh, <laughs> and uh, I know a lot of people who went there. Tom went there, I mentioned this morning. Will Greenleaf, Shankar, Shankar. Will Greenleaf was in your college, Trinity College, you know that? For one year. Dennis was there as an undergraduate or a medical student? A medical student. Did I miss anybody? Oh, yes. Okay, our man. There's our man. <laughs> so you were in Cambridge chemistry, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. So Shankar reminded me that 15 years ago, while I was still at Harvard, University of Cambridge tried to recruit me to head the Physics for Medicine Institute at uh, Cavendish Laboratory. So I went there and I visited Eagle Pub, very inspiring, with beers. Now sometimes I wonder if it is a coincidence that my work address at Harvard was 12 Oxford Street, Cambridge. British built all the great universities, including Harvard. Now, I ended up building a lab at Peking University, and five years ago, I fully returned here, Peking University. So this reminds me very strongly of something Jim Watson once said, we used to think that our fate was in our stars, but now we know that in large measure, our fate is in our genes. We're celebrating the discovery of a DNA double helix structure because it kept us busy for 70 years, and it will continue to keep us busy for years to come. The double helix continued to inspire us to unravel the mystery of life processes, especially for young people. Thank you.